And we're back here on WWE Network and Show, where I, Graham G.S. and Matthews, break down all the original content I watch on the WWE Network and on Peacock. And today we're talking the WrestleMania 37 Night 1 episode of WWE 24 for August 21st, 2021. Now, usually they've waited in the past, up until last year anyway, to premiere the WrestleMania-themed episodes of 24 until Royal Rumble the following year. Um, last year they did the Performance Center WrestleMania episode for WrestleMania 36, um, they premiered that in, like, June, like, around TakeOver time, which was weird. But it was cool. It was a very good episode, an interesting look at WrestleMania during the pandemic period. This year, they didn't wait until the Rumble either. They only premiered it only around uh, just, you know, over SummerSlam weekend, about a week, week and a half ago, which was cool. Um, having been there myself for WrestleMania 37, I thought it was super cool that we got you know, this uh, WrestleMania 24 so early, and we didn't have to wait until the Royal Rumble to get it. So like I said, they broke this up into two parts, with one episode airing after SummerSlam on Saturday, and the other one airing after TakeOver 36 on Sunday from about a week, week and a half ago. It was a great look at everyone that competed on night one of WrestleMania. We hear from Sheamus at the very beginning of this thing, even though he was in action on, I believe, night two. Um, he says, I feel like we're back, and Bianca Belair talks about how she felt like she was blown away by the reaction and being in person, in front of fans again, competing in the main event of WrestleMania Night 1 for WrestleMania 37. Uh, we hear from Cesaro, who talks about how he drove from Orlando to Tampa, because he lives in Orlando, Mania was in Tampa this year. He got stuck in two hours of traffic. So he drove himself from where he lived to Mania, almost was late for his big night, where he faced Seth Rollins one-on-one -on -one in his first singles match at WrestleMania. And he calls himself the mayor of WWE because he likes going around and talking to everyone. He's a really nice guy. And even Sheamus says that he deserves that opportunity. Uh, we get a little bit of a background on Cesaro and his WWE journey. Because uh, they've never really done like a chronicle on Cesaro or like a 24. So, I mean, I learn more about him here than I have at any other point in any other WWE production they've done. So he mentions how he's wanted to wrestle since he was 10 years old. He started wrestling in Europe around the year 2000. I think it was December 24th. Uh, 2000, if I'm not mistaken. He got in touch with William Regal around 2010 and got hired by WWE. Immediately transitioned into FCW, then the main roster in 2012. And he mentions how playing characters for him has always been very hard for him. Whether it was like the, oh my god, the yodeling shit from early 2013, late 2012 was terrible. Uh, some of the stuff that he was doing as US champion just didn't really come naturally for him. Or like the way the people stuff, because he just doesn't do a great job in his own words of playing characters. He would rather be himself. Uh, he recaps his rise from 2014 to 2015, including winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Doesn't mention the Paul Heyman connection, <laughs> obviously, because that went south very quickly. But he mentions that. He mentions becoming partners with Tyson Kidd, where they were only partners for about six months, and they won the tag team titles fairly quickly, but they were a great team. And that was when the birth of the Cesaro section happened, followed by the bar in 2016, where they won several tag team titles together before breaking back out on his own in 2019. He wanted to keep proving himself uh, as a single star, and he felt like he finally found the words to express himself on an episode of Talking Smack back in February, I believe right before Elimination Chamber. And Paul Heyman, who was on the set for that show, he was one of the co-hosts at that time, alongside Caleb Braxton, says, you know, out of character here, it was beautiful for him to watch. And Cesaro says the whole point of this story is that he wants to inspire people, and uh, that's what he feels like he's going to be able to do with his performance at WrestleMania 37. And Sheamus says that uh, he's very proud of him, which is cool. And the friendship between the bromanship, or whatever you want to call it, the bromance between Sheamus and Cesaro, is just fucking great. That's one of the highlights of this episode. I really, really enjoy it. We hear from Bobby Lashley, who they also kind of shine a bit of a spotlight on in this episode, which is cool. He says that no one works harder than him. And they go all the way back to his amateur wrestling background in high school and then in college. Uh, they recap the bank robbery. And a lot of what he talked about here, we just heard him, to well, you just heard him discuss, actually, on Broken Skull Sessions, which aired like... A week before this, like, like two weeks ago, which I got done talking here on the channel about like a week or two ago. It was a really, really good episode. <clears throat> but he recaps the story where Gerald Briscoe gave him a call, wanted to recruit him to WWE, met Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle kind of got those wheels running for him to get to WWE. Got signed by LVW, WWE's developmental territory at that point, and then later got called up to SmackDown very quickly by late 2005. Uh, we hear from MVP who recalls the great match, the great moment that was Bobby Lashley versus Umaga at Lashley's second WrestleMania, WrestleMania 23. And he says even he honestly doesn't know why Lashley left WWE in 2008. And Lashley says, well, that's the million-dollar question. It was just that time. 
Those are his exact words, and they quickly move on. They show the the screenshot of Lashley's WWE release being announced on WWE.com, and he says it was just that time. They make the implication that he left to pursue MMA, which is probably true. They didn't discuss this at all either on the Broken Skull Sessions. Now, I don't think he would discuss it here anyway on a WWE show. It's been heavily believed, if not outright confirmed, that a big reason as to why he left was the whole racial thing with Michael P.S. Hayes. Um, I believe they got into an altercation or he just wasn't happy with some of the stuff that uh, Hayes was saying. I might be mixing that up with like Mark Henry or someone like that, but I'm pretty sure that was a big reason why Lashley left in early 08. I don't know if he's ever done interviews discussing that. It's obviously a very personal thing, and he's got to work with the guy now. Um, I'm sure they don't have any bad blood now because he's back in the company and whatnot, even though Hayes is primarily, I think, an NXT guy, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, um, I thought that was interesting. So they completely gloss over why he left. They acknowledge that he left. They just don't really go into details why he did. Although they do imply, like I said, it was for MMA reasons, even though he didn't pursue MMA, MMA until like late 2009, even though he left in early 08. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They talk about his MMA career, completely gloss over the impact run, which I figured it was a 24. It would have been cool if they talked about it, but... We got enough Impact Talk, TNA Talk from Lashley on uh, Broken Skull Session, so I'm not overly disappointed, but he had a record in MMA of 15-2, and two, very impressive, and he felt like while he was away from the company, he grew mentally and physically. Called up Triple H to see if they wanted them back in 2018. Triple H said, hey, we're ready for you. Comes back the net after WrestleMania in 2018, right after WrestleMania 34, that would have been. Great moment, one of my favorite returns in recent memory. And MVP knew upon coming back to the company himself in early 2020 that he always felt Bobby Lashley in WWE could be a big-time player. It was actually Lashley's idea, he says, to form the Hurt Business. Not MVP's, not WWE's, but Bobby Lashley's. And he talks about how it wasn't supposed to be all, oh, it's supposed to be a group of black guys. That was just merely a coincidence. They all had great chemistry. It all made sense for them to be in the group. They don't recap the fact they broke up, which was fucking dumb, but nonetheless... And he fills the WWE title win, which he picked up in early March of this year, was his version of the Olympic gold medal he could not win many years earlier, which I thought was cool. We hear from Bianca Belair, who says that she can't believe that this is her life, where she's main eventing WrestleMania, and she's back in front of fans and whatnot. And back to her background here. Uh, Her brother watched wrestling growing up. That's how she kind of got into it. She idolized The Undertaker and Triple H, Stone Cold, The Rock, all the big-time players. Her parents have been there for every step of the way, she says. She started out doing a lot of athletic stuff. She's very athletic. Uh, Starting out doing gymnastics, followed by track and field. That was really where her passion was. Uh, She had eating disorders. She had an issue with eating disorders at one point in her life in late high school, early college. She goes into a lot more detail about it in an awesome episode of WWE Chronicle from earlier this year, if not late last year. I'm pretty sure it was earlier this year, but it was fucking great. Definitely make time to watch it when you get a chance. It was really, really good. Um, but at any, any rate, so at that point she struggled with depression, eventually overcame that, uh, fell in love with CrossFit. That was where Mark Henry ended up discovering her, brought her into WWE. She excelled at the tryouts. We see shots of her at the tryouts and William Regal saying her "Eh, promo wasn't all that good, but athletically she is a star. We need to bring this girl in. And she obviously is a star and she had to start from scratch, not really knowing much about wrestling. Her husband, her eventual husband, Montez Ford, uh, who she met in NXT while in developmental for WWE, Kind of helped her learn the ropes and helped her watch matches and really pick up everything she needed to know to become a big-time superstar. And it was during that first Mae Young Classic that she competed in against Kyrie Sane. Because remember, she was bumped out, I'm pretty sure, in the first round by Kyrie Sane. She didn't even make it to, like, the second or third round, I don't think. But she was in that first round. And she realized, hey, despite not having a lot of experience, I've only been doing this for about a year or so, I'm pretty good. You know, not to be cocky, but I'm pretty good, she says. And, um... You know, she had that breakout showing. She looked great. Triple H praised her. And then we fast forward all the way to the Royal Rumble, which they recap uh, from earlier this year, of course, when she won the Women's Royal Rumble. And she never thought she would headline WrestleMania, and she calls it overwhelming. So we get to WrestleMania Day itself for night one. We hear a lot of fans being interviewed outside of the arena. We hear from the Brock Lesnar guy, the Tuxedo guy, all these other famous, not, not famous, but like notable WWE fans in the arena. We see all the superstars standing on the stage, at the start of the show, which made for a great moment. Rhea Ripley recalls crying. As soon as she saw Edge get emotional, and he started getting crying, and he locked eyes with her, she got emotional too. So that, you can blame Edge for Rhea Ripley crying on the stage, despite being a badass. But in all seriousness, though, it was a great moment. So the immediate aftermath of that was that, and I, I remember because I was there, um, 
we went to a weather alert. We got a weather alert on the big screen. There was a like an incoming hurricane or a major storm or whatever. So they had to send everyone to the back, not just the superstars, but the fans. The fans could not be on the outer course of the building. So it was just like Michael Cole and Samoa Joe at ringside wearing fucking ponchos. <laughs> And we see the gorilla shot. This was probably my favorite part of this whole documentary. In the gorilla, because the McMahons were out there at on the stage a minute earlier when they had the whole roster out there. We see Vince and Gorilla are right backstage, right about to, like, not about to go out, but, like, about to send Hogan and O'Neal out there, Titus O'Neal, because they were the hosts this year. So we see O'Neal and Gorilla, Hulk Hogan and Gorilla, Vince McMahon, I don't think Shane Shane might have been there. I remember seeing Stephanie and Triple H, probably Shane. I don't remember. Maybe he had to get ready for his match. I don't remember. But then when they find out when they find out there's a weather alert and they can't go out, Hogan and O'Neill can't start the show. O'Neill just says fuck, which they obviously blur out here. And then Vince has to explain to Hogan, go take a break. We can't let you go out because the weather alert. And then Hogan's like standing there dumbfounded, like he has no idea what's going on. And Vince has to say it like two or three times, like, go take a break. Like, we're not letting you out there right now. We can't go out. (laughs) You know what I mean? It was really fucking funny. Like, the look on Hogan's face was priceless. It was just great. So anyway, uh, we hear from Heyman who says, how good of a story would it have been if it all went smoothly? And he has a good point. So they ended up kicking off the show soon after with Bobby Lashley. It might have been like a 45-minute delay. I don't remember exactly. But they ended up kicking off the actual in-ring portion of the show with Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre for the WWE title. Lashley says that it was intense walking out there. They recapped the match. Great match. Uh, Lashley felt like he was on fire out there, and he really felt like they tore the the house down in the opening match. Uh, They recapped the rest of the card. uh, AJ and Omos versus The New Day. AJ and Omos. Oh, wait. That was on night two, wasn't it? That was on night one. I don't remember. Maybe it was night one. But um, they recap it here. They recap the tag team turmoil match, which was fucking awful. And the funny part is that, not not really funny, but they recap parts of the tag team turmoil women's tag team match. They show Carmella making her entrance, but they don't show who her partner is. They show Ruby Riot later on getting pinned. They don't show who Carmella's partner was, and that's because it was Billy Kay, and she got fired like a week later. I guess maybe Ruby Riot made the cut because she, <laughs> she didn't get fired till June. It's a little different. Maybe they started editing this in April. I don't know. Uh, they don't show Billy Kay, so N- not surprising. It's just one of those WWE things. Like, who cares? Just show her, you know. She was a part of the event. But they recap all the other matches, Braun and Shane, um, the rest of the card at night one of WrestleMania. And then, then, we get to, then we get to Cesaro versus Seth Rollins on the show. Cesaro gets interviewed right before him backstage by the cameras, and he says he was very nervous. And he's very thankful for Seamus being there and supporting him and whatnot. So they recapped the match, which was fucking great. I love the Belair Sasha main event, but I honestly think Cesaro and Seth was the show stealer of that WrestleMania. That was my favorite match in the entire show. They really went out there and fucking killed it. That UFO spot was amazing. Uh, Cesaro felt like they hit a home run. And Orton congratulates him afterwards. Seamus congratulates him. Seamus said he popped big. Him and McIntyre both when they were watching the Mac they were watching the match back from Gorilla. Uh, they popped big for like the UFO, and Cesaro said that he was saving that for a major moment at a WrestleMania, and he had it in his back pocket all these years, and I don't think he's done it since. Maybe he has, but it was a great fucking moment, though. And it means a lot to him to have all the support that he has coming off his WrestleMania win. Uh, they recap the Damian Priest and Bad Bunny versus Miz and Morrison tag team match, which was a lot of fun. And then we hear from Bianca Belair, who really felt calm before she went out there and it really sunk in for her during the quiet moments of the night that she was headlining WrestleMania and they were making history. Uh, she allowed herself to absorb the moment when the bell rang and really let it sink in that they were making history about to have this great match in the main event of WrestleMania. They recapped the match here between Sasha and Bianca for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Bianca wins, becomes SmackDown Women's Champion. And while she's celebrating, she even says here, she looked to her family at ringside and said, I did it, I did it, and it was a great awesome moment. Uh, Montez Ford ran down her husband and they celebrated together. That was cool. Got to celebrate with her family at ringside. She got to hug her brother. And uh, it was more than just about her, her, as she said. It was about her family and her husband. It was about the people, she, the little girl she got to inspire, which was cool. And Montez gets emotional while being interviewed, saying that he's really happy that his daughter got to see that moment. I, they don't have a daughter together, I don't believe. I believe they have a daughter. Uh, Montez has a daughter from another marriage or whatever, another relationship. But, you know, they're basically, it's basically their daughter is uh, for, for Bianca and Montez. And Montez says that it was really cool for his daughter to have that moment to see Bianca become champion. He gets really emotional talking about it. And that was pretty much it. And they celebrate together and the episode ends. So it actually ended with a teaser for the um, second part 
which went up the next day, part two of, in night two of WrestleMania 37, that episode of WWE 24, which I haven't watched yet. That one looks really good. Uh, the main event of that show, Edge, Brian, and Roman was fucking awesome. So I still say night one was better uh, in terms of the overall show. I'm not talking about the 24 here, but both nights of WrestleMania this year were a lot of fun. And this was a, uh, a very good WWE 24 documentary and did a great job of really recapping the biggest moments and focusing on the biggest superstars from the night. The feel-good stories with Cesaro and Bel Air and Bobby, uh, which I thought was really cool. So well, yeah, two thumbs up. Check this out when you get a chance. It clocks in at around 55 minutes, just under an hour. And I love that they're putting credits to the end of these things now, too. They've been doing these 24s for years now, like five or six, seven years. But they haven't started putting the credits at the end until just recently. So I think it's really cool they're giving credit to all the people to help put this thing together, which I really appreciate and enjoy. Uh, great stuff here. Be sure to check it out on the Peacock app or WWE Network, whatever. WWE 24, WrestleMania 37, Night 1. Thank you guys for checking out this review. I appreciate it. Be sure to like this video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content, and hit the bell button to be notified every time a new video goes up. Have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham G. S. Matthews. Stay tuned for WrestleMania 37, Night 2, WWE 24 review going up at some point this week. Probably tomorrow or Wednesday. Keep an eye out for it. But have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham G. S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.